War is peace. Freedom is slavery. And debunking a coronavirus conspiracy is actually promoting a coronavirus conspiracy. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Amazon has transformed its operations in response to COVID-19 to protect employees and keep packages flowing. Amazon has transformed its operations in response to COVID-19 to protect employees and keep packages flowing. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy while still delivering those packages to your doorstep. The company is keeping employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe. And Today, I unfortunately have no guests. I think one of my guests was close to being in the same place at the same time, but I think everything just sort of fell through there, in part because of my netbook, my Chromebook. Music, come back. There we go. Okay. But Google hardware device that I really should replace one of these days got an upgrade that totally broke all of my live video. So I have been spending a good part of today troubleshooting why this was broken and how to fix it. And I was able to get it working. So I am basically back to where I was yesterday, but down a couple of hours. So, and especially notable for this show, the time zone I have not set yet. So I am actually normally broadcasting on Thunder Bay time. And today I'm broadcasting on Saskatoon time due to technical difficulties. So hello, peanut gallery. But, and one thing I want to mention before I go too far is that I forgot to mention what the music was of the last show. And that was, of course, DJ Schnitz and his Water. Very old song at this point, probably old enough that some people alive to listen to the show may even have not been alive when it was recorded. But I find it kind of interesting, and I come back to it every once in a while, because even though it is a anti-consumer rant, a rant against the commercialization of water, of something so plain and basic and necessary to human survival, and yet you can purchase it for a dollar a bottle or $1.50 or whatever the price was back in 2000. I don't think it's actually gone up that much in price, which is, again, probably a, a makes sense given it is one of the most abundant resources on the planet. Even though in most cases where you're going to just like take a random cup of water off the surface of the planet, it's going to be salty water and you're not going to be able to drink it and it needs to be processed and whatnot. But even so, it is worth thinking about that and that particular question in terms of there are resources like that that are basically ubiquitous. Air is another one. Information is a third, where it's everywhere. It's all around us, and it's possible to make a business and to sell it as a product and to put some value add into it and to process it or to package it or to enclose it somehow using legal or technical measures. But it's worth reminding ourselves that these common resources, these Resources that are all over the place, they are all over the place. And if we really had to, we could, for example, 
create a bottling company, or not a company, but like a, a government agency specifically dedicated to spreading bottles of water. And yes, it would cut into their profit, and there may be ecological consequences that would probably not be that much different than the consequences we're already facing, but it's something that we could do. And uh, yeah, water is a human right, exactly. Like, on some level, it's important that we make sure that every single human being in the world has access to water. And if every single human being in the world does not have access to water, then that is a problem. And we can work out the details of who pays for what and what segments of society have to pay what for it and all those things. Uh, but there is that level at which we still have to keep in mind that there is a lot of water on the surface of the planet. There's enough for everybody. We just have to figure out how to distribute it and how to get the salt out. And these are technical issues that are hard to solve, but with the mind power and hard work of 7.8 billion people now, we should be able to do it. And if we're not doing it, then we should be working on it. And I mean, yes, is this the thing that you should spend your time doing? That's a question I'll leave up to you. Don't throw yourself and sacrifice yourself too much over it. But it's something that if you did, if you did work your entire life on this problem, it would be a valuable thing and it would be an honorable thing to spend a lifetime doing. And I have worked on an irrigation farm. I've done a little bit on this side, but I'd love personally to do more on it. And so that's something to think about. The other thing that came up this week is a question. And so I'm going to throw this into the void here of the listenership. Now, I am a, a masker. I wear a mask every day. Whenever I leave my apartment, I make sure to have a mask. I wear a mask while biking to work, probably a little bit overkill, but I still do it. I wear a mask at work all the time, or at least as much as possible. And generally, since the reopening has started here in Saskatchewan, I've tried to make sure that I'm ahead of the pack in terms of always being covered up. But this week, I've thought of something that, uh, even though like there's a thread on Facebook that I'm going to link to the in this thread, where there's a discussion about the science of masks and how much do masks actually help with COVID? And are they a good idea to wear? Is it a good idea for children to wear them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I think there is still some reasonable doubt on that side in terms of there is science going on right now. I, again, personally wear masks. I personally think that they're a good idea, but I don't know enough about the empirical science to be sure. And since I'm not sure, I'm not going to say that, yes, you know, they have to be mandatory or something like that. Although I think there is an argument to be made on that side. But here's the question. Here's the big question. What happens at minus 40? How are these little blue masks going to handle being so cold that when you breathe through them, they immediately freeze into ice? How is that going to work? Has anyone ever worn one of these little blue masks outside in the 40 below? Or is it just going to be assumed that you're covered up anyway with something cloth and that that's your mask? Is that how this is going to work? Are we going to have to have our, our scarves, our face masks, our buffs, our cloth masks, and then a little, what is it, ultrasound felt blue COVID mask? Is that how it's going to work? What is the rule, or what are the rules going to be, one? And two, how are the masks themselves going to handle cold? Because I am kind of curious about how that's going to work here in Saskatchewan specifically. Now, in places that don't get to minus 40, I mean, you don't have this excuse here. Like, it's, you either do the science and figure out whether it's a good idea to wear them, but minus 40 specifically, or at least, like, significantly below minus zero, it does start to become an issue in and of itself. And are we going to be, how is this going to work? I don't know. So if you have any idea of how this is going to play out, uh, definitely leave a comment or send an email at jeffreydupthiff at gmail.com or ricochet me at uh, ricochet, hold on, M-S-Z-I-S-N-A-F for Oscar, 7, P for Q, Q, P for K1, H, R for Romeo, P for Delta. That, again, is a end-to-end encrypted communication, decentralized communication platform running on top of Tor, which is the main instant message client that I use. Although it's been replaced by Quitch, I have not used Quitch yet. But do go try Quitch out if you are a developer. So, but that's not the only thing going on this week. The other thing, I was, as you may know, if you're listening to my MP3s right now, or YouTube, or BitChute channel, or Stitcher, or uh, maybe even Spotify, although if you are listening to Spotify, please delete your account. Do not listen to Spotify. Spotify is... It is bad news all around. It is a or basically a tool of the RIA to oppress your mind. But the I am behind, I'm behind a couple of shows. Still editing episode. I think it's 75 right now. So that's a couple of weeks ago. And the show that I'm actually editing is talking about the India and China mix-up at their border. That 
was going on a couple of weeks ago and has been going on for the past couple of weeks. And I decided to check into it just before the show to see where this is, to like follow up of where at least the media, the major media, is seeing where this confrontation is. Because the last I had heard, there were shots being fired, perhaps accidental, perhaps a third party who was trying to make the two sides come to a full battle. But regardless of who was shooting and who shot first, after that event, this is from the New York Times, quote, the foreign ministers of the two countries issued a five-point statement aimed at ending the simmering confrontation. A previous pledge was followed by the deadliest clash in decades. And it shows the photo of the foreign minister Wang Yi and his Indian counterpart. And quote, China and India have once again pledged to defuse tensions along their contested Himalayan border. Days after officials in both countries accused the other of firing shots in the region for the first time in decades. A previous promise to step back from a broader military conflict made in June failed to end the Hmong Forum confrontation. Skirmishes have continued as troops on both sides jockeyed for control of the forbidden mountainous territory along their 2,000-mile border. Da -da -da. And so the point here is that as of September 11th, there was a move for peace. There was a move for peace. It is certainly not the only move that has been made for peace between these two great powers. And maybe it'll hold, maybe it won't. I think it's a little too early to judge exactly how long it, uh, such a thing could hold. Such a thing could hold forever. Such a thing could last not even as long as it took to print this article. It is a step in the right direction, but I guess we'll see going forward how long this could hold. And let's see what else the New York Times says. Prama Chilani, professor of strategic studies at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, said there was nothing new in the statement, as in the pledge announced in June that directly addressed India's accusations that China had seized new territory. Quote, the lesson of, from the collapse of the accord was that China was willing to defuse tensions if India would accept the new facts on the ground. Quote, he said. Well, there is something new there, though, that it is being restated, that there is this desire for peace on both sides, and regardless who gets the benefit of peace. And if China has control on the ground, then China is going to get more of the benefit of the peace. But India also gets benefit of the peace too. They save face, they don't get completely and utterly destroyed as a civilization and, and the world, because again, both of these two countries are nuclear powers. China probably has no more nuclear weapons than India, but I guess it's really hard to tell either way. Okay, so, that, but that was the New York Times point. We always want to go to other points of view. Let's see. We've got the ABC News. They're saying, quote, India, China to disengage thousands of border troops. So this is a little different than the last agreement, right? So the last agreement, they agreed to stand down. Did they actually disengage thousands of border troops? I do not recall hearing that. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But well, let's see, how many did they say here? Asian giants have accused each other of sending soldiers into rival territory with, and firing warning shots. For the first time in 45 years, that how much we know. Uh, this one, it emphasizes that it's a 3,500 kilometer. Didn't the other New York Times said 2,000 kilometers? What's going on here? Hold on, let's see this, this number. Why is this different? There we go. Okay. Oh, I see, I see. So it's 2,000 mile. Uh, and then ABC News says 2,175 mile. Now, is that the New York Times just rounding? Is that just the a guesstimate? Why are these two numbers different? That is... I mean, obviously, a contentious border where the estimates range over 175 miles probably isn't the sort of thing that you want to guess at the level of four significant figures. But I think looking at this, it, what they're doing is that the ABC is taking another press release that is in kilometers, because we know ABC would actually use kilometers on their own. And they're converting it to miles, and then it's got four significant figures because of that. Whereas the New York Times is actually like rounding at the miles, so that's probably where these two are coming from. So anyway, from Ladakh in the west to India's eastern state of Arunachal Pradesh, which is another place I've never heard of, and it makes me sad because there's probably like 50 to 100 million people living in it. But, quote, the current standoff is over portions of pristine landscape that boasts the world's highest landing strip and a glacier that feeds one of the largest irrigation systems in the world. Ooh. Water, water wars, that is a, not a good thing to be fighting over. Really not a good thing. That's a sign that both countries are probably, especially China, is probably running out, out of alternative sources of clean water. So their solution is to, what, take someone else's water? Come on, we can do better than that. Quote, both sides accuse the other of provocative behavior, including crossing into each other's territories, blah, 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 blah. 
They are... Oh, there we are. Rival soldiers brawled in Manju with clubs, stones, and fists. I talked about this a little bit in the last show on this topic, where it's really unique in the history of the world post-gunpowder that they opted specifically not to use guns for most of this conflict and to basically treat it as a giant mass security issue rather than a military issue, even though they're using military personnel to do it. So that is to keep things from escalating, but both sides are doing it, so it's kind of like a tit-for-tat thing. Quote, China reported no casualties, uh, Indian, or with 20 Indian soldiers dead. Of course, China's every interest not to report casualties, because if they report casualties, they have to admit that there was a clash. And as we learned in the last show, if you admit in China that there was a clash, at least for most of this conflict, you would get hauled up in front of some kind of torture committee or something and forced to recant your beliefs publicly which is what happened back then. So that is not necessarily to be trusted. There's, there may be some casualties on the Chinese side, but we will never know, or at least not know until we get some different kind of government in China that's a little bit more open about such things. So that was the ABC. Uh, what do we got? India, or Yahoo India, talks a little bit about what's also paywalled. We don't care about that. Uh, let's see, NBC, MSNBC. Also, doesn't look like they're, quote, the troops are barely a few hundred meters apart at some point. The immediate task would be for troops to step back from the areas of friction. China and India have accused each other of firing into the air during the confrontation, a violation of the long-held protocol not to use firearms on the sensitive frontier. So that's kind of an interesting data point, where it may not even be that the guns are pointed at each other. It's just like a little tiny escalation in terms of both of them brought the guns to the table and are making a point to the other side that, oh, hey, you know, we could use guns. And then that's what this is about. Well, that might be part of it. Uh, Wall Street Journal, Paywall, Yahoo again. We already saw Yahoo. The National Interest. What the hell is the National Interest? Well, this is all from DuckDuckGo and Google, by the way. Just doing like a quick survey. So Wikipedia, nationalinterest.org. The National Interest is an American bi-monthly conservative affairs magazine published by journalist Jacob Heilbrunn and published by the Center for the National Interest, a public policy think tank based in D.C. that was established by Nixon. <laughs> that's, that's definitely a... Uh, sounds legit, right? The guy who resigned because he was such a damn crook and this is his legacy? Really? Okay. I'm not even going to bother with this one, honestly. USA News. I mean, I'm sure it's probably about as good as all these other ones, but it doesn't even load. MSN, we already saw. Uh, BBC, there we go. So, how, quote, how India and China brought peace for now. A uh, deal quick. Earlier this week, quote, China's state-run Global Times had said Chinese troops would, quote, quickly deal a heavy blow to Indian troops and they will be all annihilated if Delhi provoked war, which is probably true. That is the state of affairs. Like, if China and India actually go to a hot war that escalates beyond just, like, one little frontier, then there will be mass death in both countries especially along the region where the fighting is occurring. Like, these are nuclear powers we were talking about. And it only takes one bomb to wipe out uh, basically everybody involved, at least in the frontier. If not, you know, maybe a couple of bombs, if that. But it is, it wouldn't take much. So India kind of rattled their saber a bit. Da, da, da. So, quote, what made the countries agree to de-escalate it when few expected it to happen? Many observers, including Michael Kugelman, a deputy director at the Wilson Center think tank, What's up with these presidential think tanks? Is this, like, something that presidents do after they, like, leave office as they form a think tank? And then, like, what's the oldest think tank founded by a president? This is an open question for you guys, the listeners. You can be looking this up as I am doing this podcast. Figure it out, because I'm kind of curious now. Quote, believe that both countries were ready for confrontation, but they also realized that a war, even a limited one, was not an option. Okay, well, that, that sentence doesn't really make any sense, but whatever. Okay, quote, it would be catastrophic for both countries and the wider region. Yes, no kidding. The economic states were too... The economic states. Like, it, at the level of nuclear war, it's no longer economic states anymore. Like, it's the total annihilation of the human species. You know? This is not economics anymore. This is the survival. This is the lives of at least 2 billion people, probably all of us. Economic stakes. Come on. Economic stakes. This is not economic stakes we are dealing with. Quote, the fact that Mr. Jashinkar served as ambassador for Beijing for many years and is known to share good relations with Chinese diplomats appears to have helped. 
that's good. Good that they're bringing important personalities with lots of connections in there. That's what we need to break the ice. Quote, it did break the ice, uh, Mr. Kogelman said, adding that personal relations often play a role in crucial diplomatic negotiations. Weather, an unlikely factor, may have also played a role. The higher ridges of the Gowan Valley become inhospitable in winters. You know, it may have played a role, but I would not put it past either side to be willing to forego weather when risking nuclear war. Like, what was it, Hannibal who marched the elephants over, what is it, the Alps uh, in Europe? And, I mean, it's not without historical precedent that armies could be moved over mountain ranges in what are basically winter conditions. It's, yeah, life on planet Earth, exactly. And so it's not unthinkable, but, quote, continuing on. Lieutenant General Vinod Badia, who's... Do they say lieutenant or lieutenant in India? It's a British colony, so it's probably lieutenant. Anyway, quote, who served in the Indian Army, says troops are used to operating in harsh conditions, but given a chance, both armies would want to avoid that. True. India may have used this advantage as a bargaining chip. India's COVID-19 caseload continues to rise at an alarming rate. Economy is suffering, or any armed confrontation would affect the country's ability to overcome these issues. Yeah, again, like, this is like having your house next to, what, what was it that caused the Beirut explosion? Ammonium nitrate? Like a giant container of ammonium nitrate. And your neighbors are firing off fireworks, and you're worried about them smoking. Right, like that's the scale of the ridiculousness of worrying about such minor things as a hundred thousand people dying, right? To compare to what the the other side of this could easily, easily lead to. But in the meanwhile, though, let's actually take a look to see with the dashboard for COVID, Encov twenty nineteen dot live. Let's see if they have the Indian numbers. Uh, India, India, India. There we go. Okay. So they are gaining 93,000 known COVID cases per day. Let me get a graph. Uh, why is there no graphs? Oh, here we are. By the Center for System Science and Engineering, John Hopkins. And India is gaining, it, it is at 4,700,054, 356 cases. And their exponential growth of cases has leveled off a little bit. They're starting to get into like a linear increase per day. So that is a, I guess if it's linear increase per day, that would be like a quadratic. I think that would be quadratic cases total. But they're at about they're measuring at a damn near 100,000 cases a day too. So somewhere between 90 and 100,000 uh, cases known in India per day. So that is a little bit of pressure to do something about the situation of basically anything else they can uh, put the fires out. And that's like that's a huge number of people to get sick. Never mind sick with something that can easily kill one plus percent of the people who get it. So that that's like a thousand people dying a day. That's that's starting to get up there. Right, let's see what else we got. The area is too big, and it'll take time for commanders to come to an understanding. Military level talks will happen when tensions are still high and emotions are raw. The Chinese troops have gone deep into the territory that India claims, and there's no clarity if they will vacate these positions. Uh, what caused the escalation will also determine how quickly disengagement can happen. A major factor cited as a source of tension is the new road that connects the Indian Army to the stations in the region to a forward air base. And then they show a picture of the map. The map, the road is not really in any disputed areas. It's, uh, it goes through the Galwan River Valley, and it is totally on India's side of the line of control, although it goes, again, near the line of control near the uh, Galwan River Valley. And that is also the location of the June 15, 2020 clash. Let's see here. It shows a picture of some Indian soldiers beside some ice walls, which is Quote, India has expedited the construction of roads along its border with China, and so they became more aggressive. The President Xi and Modi have met 18 times since 2014. That's a good sign. That's a, that's a really good sign that it's at least getting as high as it is. It would probably be better if they were meeting more, but it takes time to sort these things out, too. So that's uh, worth keeping in mind. It's a good start, quote, unquote. So, oh, here we go, and then Mint, uh, livemint.com. I just want to see what my ranking of Mint is, because I don't really recognize it. But, okay, let's just see if they have anything new to say here. As of past little while, they talk a little bit about the unit in India that was involved. Otherwise, no real new details there. The Indian Express, there we go. Understanding India-China five-point action plan to reduce LEC tension. India Express uh, speaks to Major General Professor 
G.G. Dwyfdi, retired, if I'm pronouncing that right, who's commanding troops in this sector and served as a, a defense attaché in China, to put idiot China thoughts in perspective. Good guy to do that, honestly. Uh, sounds like it. Okay. So they arrived at the Five Points of Agreement, and they linked to another Indian Times, or Indian Express article about that. Uh, quote, how significant were the Indian China talks? The process of dialogue between nations is vital, especially when the two are neighbors with strained relations. This meeting between the two foreign ministers was an attempt to break the impasse as a series of talks have taken place at multiple levels without yielding any results. It was also good optics. And, quote, the current threshold is well below the threshold of conflict if we talk of the escalatory ladder. And uh, can you briefly expa- explain the escalation and de-escalation matrix? Well, the genesis of the current standoff was the aggression marked by the PLA. Okay, well, this is the Indian side saying that that's why it's happening, but whatever. Quote, in the form of incursions by the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, that quote, given the scale, extent, and timing, the operation was well planned at the highest levels, a central military commission headed by President Jinping as its chairman. I mean, this goes right to the top. This is not like some rogue military... This isn't Dr. Strangelove. This is like the Chinese leadership playing with the leadership of India. Continuing, quote, While the political intent was to give a strong message to Delhi to count how division was interest, the military aim was to make quick territorial gains in Defsang, Galwan, and Pangong So area. This marked the first step in the escalatory ladder, which almost went off as planned for China. India's army's swift rear deployment took escalation to the next level. Uh, this is sounding a little on the bias side, but who knows? Maybe this is how it actually went. A bloody skirmish, that was the one with the clubs and knives and that sort of thing. A rapid buildup on both sides led to steep escalation in which 40,000 PLA soldiers stand deployed with an almost equal number on the Indian side. However, the situation remained regulated by talks at the military, diplomatic, and political levels. This is probably like one of those cases where like in real time we can see that the military arm basically does the, the pushing and the talking heads do the talking and there's like all these levels of action going on. But it basically, regardless of how coordinated it is, it's, it's like a big machine. Right. And so it's not like you're, as in an individual joining the army in China or, or India, like you could probably have some kind of impact here, but you're in a big group of tens of thousands of people and things kind of move all at once. So continuing on, quote, however, the situation remained regulated by talks. Okay, a little further down. Quote, technically, the conflict situation consists of actions such as the building of fortifications, clashes between patrolling parties, Laying of mines, which, by the way, is inter- illegal under international law. I wonder if India and China have signed on the uh, anti land mine treaty. Let's uh, go take a look at that. The Ottawa Treaty, prohibiting the use, stockpiling, and transfer of anti-personnel mines, and on their destruction, uh, is signed by 164 parties, with 32 UN states, including China, Russia, and the United States, have not India. Let's see, India. India is also one of the ones that has not. Okay, so both sides are totally okay with at least abstaining from removing landmines from the field of war, which is, I mean, it makes sense in terms of preventing nuclear war and preventing uh, border clashes that could escalate to nuclear war. So there's probably an argument to be made on that. But I would encourage anyone who has not yet done so to just go Google or go search or uh, go on YouTube and see if you can find some videos and pictures of children who have lost limbs to mines. And just, like, spend a little bit of time looking at what minds do to human beings who are not involved in this conflict, or at least not directly involved. They're not the soldiers. They're not, they may be born a generation after, or two generations after, or maybe even more. But the minds stay in the ground, they stay, stay operational, and as children do what children do, they run around and play in places they shouldn't. God knows I've done that when I was young. Then they step on a mine, and boom, there goes their leg. And it's a very, very sad thing that affects many, many children around the world. And if they're laying mines for this conflict, it's going to affect children in that region going forward for generations. And it's it's not a good thing generally, although it's understandable in this case. But anyway, continuing on. Quote, the 1993 Maintenance of Peace and Tranquility Agreement forms the basis of all follow-up agreements. The 1996 conference building measures denounced the use of force. 2005 standard standard operating procedures and patrolling modalities. 2012 process of consultation and cooperation. 2013 border cooperation agreement signed as a sequel to the Dipsang intrusion by the PLA. There is no requirement for additional agreements. The moot point is their implementation as these have been violated by the PLA. So it's all the other side that's doing the violation. It's not India. It's totally all China. 
Uh -huh. Quote, uh, in pursuit of its, quote, nibble and negotiate strategy. In fact, all these agreements have only helped China to consolidate its claims over a period of time by waging a bulletless war. That, that part actually probably is accurate. Well, that sounds like what they would do. But, quote, continuing on. The mechanism of strategic guidance evolved at Wuhan. Wuhan, interesting. And later confirmed at, oh God, uh, Mamalapur between Modi and Xi Jinping has not delivered despite the fact that Xi is the commander and in chief of the PLA. What should be India's future strategy? Well, China has not been able to achieve its aims either politically or militarily due to India's firm and resolute response. This will definitely reflect upon Xi Jinping's Iron Man image. It is worth noting that Xi would like to add his achievements that can be flaunted during the centenary celebrations of the Communist Party of China in 2021 at the, and the 20th Party Congress. So they're kind of making it personal. Like, it's purely this this one strongman leader, and it's not the entire bureaucracy of the PRC, or, or at least large portions of it, that probably agree entirely with what he's doing. Like, I would not be surprised that there's the various stakeholder groups within the PRC, that this is, pushing for this is one of their aims. Like, I know pushing for similar things with, with respect to the American government is definitely part of the, the equivalent of their party platform. Uh, so I don't know why they're making it entirely about Z. That is a very strange thing for them to be doing. Anyway, continuing on. Quote, the force level deployed by China in Xi Chin with two strike divisions, the 150 frontline fighter aircraft position on the forward bases. It's basically the saber rattling on the Indian side. India must continue its provocative posture, not only in Ladakh, but across the complete length of the LAC, after all its position on the ground, which will decide the trajectory of talks on the negotiation. This kind of talk, that's how war starts right there. Where it's like, their posture has to be strong, threatening, and that's the only language that the Chinese kind of understand. That That's basically... If, if, I mean, who knows, maybe it'll work, but that sounds like a, a sure path to further tension and further mistakes along the line of control and further escalation of violence. But that's the perspective of that particular major general. Let's see here. I've got the Financial Times, which I'm surprised isn't paywalled. Usually they are. Let's see here. We've got this one is India China are edging towards a more serious conflict. But this was from what day? What's this from? It doesn't say. That would be, a, oh, 15 hours ago. There we go. Oh, okay. So that's fairly recent. Especially considering, like, we're half the world away. So, like, there are time zone issues where they're probably asleep right now. <laughs> so, or at least just waking up. So the interesting stuff is yet to come today. Specifically in June, they talk about the clashes in June. The mountainous train. We've got meetings at high levels. The motives on China side, quote, President Xi Jinping has generally pursued an assertive foreign policy and might see an opportunity to make tactical gains. But even in this context, does it make sense for China to risk a war with India? China's assertiveness has put an end to all strategic ambiguity on India's part as it seeks a closer relationship with the U.S. and embraces anti-China alliances such as the quadrilateral society dialogue with the U.S., Japan, and Australia. Interesting. That's a, a new term. I haven't encountered that one. India's also signaled its resolve to decouple economically from China, banning Chinese apps, crafting a strategy to remove to other suppliers, to move to other suppliers for apps. Is that what they're talking about there? Weird. Okay. If Z is looking for ways to shore up his domestic credibility, then the puzzle is why is the conflict getting so little play at home. Another plausible hypothesis is that China is worried about the future of Tibet, with strengthening international support for its struggle for independence. This sounds not at all like the China-Tibet thing has been going on for as long as I've been alive, and I've heard basically nothing of it. Now, granted, maybe there's stuff going on at the UN that I'm not hearing or something, but I really find that hard to believe. This is a big stretch. Quote, and he still hopes both the Dalai Lama, who's also getting not any younger, by the way, and he recently got in trouble for basically saying that he's not going to be reborn as a woman. So that's kind of interesting. Quote, Tibet's government in exile and China may be exerting pressure to prevent interference. It's exactly this uncertainty that makes the situation so risky. With winter approaching, it makes little sense for China to keep tens of thousands of troops camped on high mountains with temperatures plunging 20 to 30 degrees, oh, 20 to 30 degrees, uh, below zero. India reported with its own troop escalation, the high stakes game is clearly afoot. Well, pausing for a moment, India maintains a large enough military that like 20,000 people, like, they could lose 20,000 people. They could 
like they they would disappear in the night and they wouldn't miss like it's they have so many extra people there right now especially men that like 20,000 people it's not a big deal at all and I don't know why they would make even the point of mentioning I mean 20,000 lives lost would be a, a big tragedy like that's way more lives lost than for example we saw lost in Beirut in the past couple of weeks but it's still, like, really not a big number. So, quote, It is exactly this uncertainty that made the situation so risky. Okay. Of quote, We can no longer count on old assurances to prevent conflict. In modern warfare, harsh winters and difficult physical training are much less of a barrier than they once were. If bitter winter did not deter the Red Army... We're talking about the Red Army. Skipping that... Uh, kind of nonsense article. Uh, paragraph, quote, uh, The Galwan Valley incident has turned public opinion in India virulently anti-China. This will make disengagement difficult. There is a growing consensus that New Delhi must be prepared to stand up to Beijing. Modi's image will be severely dented at home if he does not craft a strong riposte. This leaves Xi with two options. Inflict the damage and brace for consequences, or withdraw to pre-June positions in this phase. That is kind of an interesting conundrum, uh, if that is truly the issue. But I have this strange suspicion that the FT is actually trying to concoct this feeling of pressure in India through this article and probably in other media, depending on how they do this. But it may just very well be that there's, this is an immediate push from outside of India to get them to act more strongly in this regard. But that's conjecture on my part. So, quote, the international context also makes the chances of conflict more likely. It is not a coincidence that the previous major conflict between India and China, the war in 1962, occurred when the U.S. was distracted at the time with the Cuban Missile Crisis. The weeks between now and the U.S. presidential election in November, which coincide with the propitious weather for military movements on the border, will see Americans preoccupied with their own political drama and a polarized electorate. It is no longer possible to dismiss the conflict between India and China as a skirmish. The understanding reached last week between the country's foreign ministers points to a pause, but it does not address the underlying issues that have pushed the countries closer to serious conflict. The American historian Barbara Tuchman is often cited as observing, quote, the war is unfolding of miscalculations, unquote. The next few months might prove a test case for that hypothesis. And that is an interesting quote, because, because, I am holding in my hand the book, uh, <laughs> the book uh, Barbara Tuckman's Practicing History, which is her memoirs, or at least a series of essays written by her about the practice of history and the understanding of history and the ways that things can go right and wrong. And that very much does actually like fall into the perspective in this particular book. But it's actually a pretty good one. I like the last chapter right now, and... I don't remember, I don't think she touches on India Pakistan too much. Actually, I think they had an index, so let me check. Nope, no index here. That's too bad. Uh, an index would actually be kind of handy. Mm, yeah, I think it's mentioned a little bit as like a, or an aside in a couple of these chapters, but it would be interesting to see her particular perspective on this conflict too. So, got DW, what is DW.com? And you might be wondering at this point, like, all I've talked about today is the India-China border issue. And why focus so much? Why spend all this time? Why go so deep into what all these different people are saying and all the, the little details that are coming out of this particular conflict? And of course, the answer is because all of our lives depend on it. Maybe it won't be us out here listening who connect the people in India and Pakistan and China to come to an understanding of their borders. But it's important that people around the world, especially those of us who have a little bit of time, if you're in lockdown and due to COVID, as we're forced to stay home and to do things that don't involve a lot of other people per se, you can read about this. You can find books about this. You can learn Chinese, learn Hindi, learn Bangla, learn Arabic or you can learn these various languages, or at least little bits and pieces of them, and start having media in your life from the two participants in this conflict. Go and seek out Chinese media. Go and seek out Indian media. Go read the Epoch Times. Go read the, uh, what is it, the India Express. Go read the various accounts of what's going on here, so that when you see one or the other side trying to make their case, that it isn't just one-sided, that it isn't just the fake news of 158 soldiers maybe being injured or something along those lines. Make sure that, that you're at least leading yourself towards understanding the sides of the conversation. Maybe it's too much to like try to become part of the conversation. There's enough voices in it as is talking and not enough listening. 
There's enough people fighting with each other, not enough people trying to make peace. There's enough people trying to push for geopolitical aims of the various belligerents, not enough people trying to find ways to resolve this conflict before it spins out of control and leads to millions, if not billions, of people dying in a global war. And with that, I'll end my show for the day. If you enjoyed this little skimming of the surface of media on this particular topic, don't be afraid to go to subscribestar.com slash jeff-cliff and help fund the effort of doing so. I'm not above hiring researchers, by the way, for uh, deep dives on particular conversations. And I'm going to end with a... It's a commercial, but it's kind of like a tongue-in-cheek commercial but for the feathers. So hopefully you enjoy this and it comes through okay. And I will see you all next week. Mastodon Social. I mean, Unomia, also known as Fedverse, is a publishing platform originally created so that people could get away from the political hellscape known as Twitter and utilize a web publishing protocol, which used to be O status, but now it's Activity Pub, and you'd better worship the fucking guy who made it or write a passive aggressive hot take about you on his blog to send messages to people across servers and networks. It's now home to a diverse variety of terrible opinions, a non-stop barrage of politics, from people representing different breeds of animals, and an unhealthy amount of lolly. Originally, the Fediverse, a distributed and federated network, allowed users to control their social networking experience without the slimy tentacles of centralized organizations butting in to dictate policy, amongst other things. This is a pretty radical and exciting idea. But like all things decentralized, most people don't have the intellectual capacity to know what to do with themselves after breaking free of the chains of their corporate and government overlords. So after a few years, everyone realized that bureaucracy was popular for a reason, and the lords of the Fediverse decided to slowly incorporate confusing standards into their software so that everyone split across different platforms found it nearly impossible to communicate with each other, leaving everyone once again stuck inside all of their all-inclusive bubbles. This is where you come in. The Fediverse is a great place to make new friends and then lose them after they radicalize themselves to some strange cyber dystopian brand of communist fur dom nationalism. You'll enjoy watching spiral of depravity as your friends and their notes self-destruct due to the emotional and economic cost of having an original idea online. Though, not all is lost. There are still remnants of culture across this space. There is a fertile ground untainted by ideology outside of free software and distributed networking. Though many gardens may be walled and many servers gated behind the ten blockless commandments of virtue, opportunity remains. Join the Fediverse, carry the banner of freedom, and forge your own destiny at the side of your brothers and sisters and whatever other kin in autism. The Fediverse is still the Wild West and gold is still on the horizon. We'll see you there, partner.